Pam Warren was not expected to survive. She was on a commuter train from Reading into Paddington, London, on October the 5th, 1999, and at 10 past eight in the morning, that train crashed badly. More than 500 people were injured, 31 people lost their lives, and a fireball ripped through the carriage that Pam was in. Her injuries were so bad that medics arriving on the scene described her as a no-hoper. After three weeks in a coma and multiple skin graft operations, she learned to be really resilient. And in this part one of a boostcast with Pam, she's going to talk about moving from coping into taking positive action to drive better outcomes. In this case, it's to help rail safety in Britain for all of us. So the the focus of this boostcast is around how do you turn resilience into action? And that's why I'm thrilled Pam Warren is with me because you epitomise doing just that, Pam. Oh, thank you. Not just being resilient, but also making use of that mental strength to make a difference to people's lives. Because those people who've not heard of you before, or indeed the lady in the mask, is won't know that one of the things you have done is make rail safety for everyone in Britain who goes on a train much, much safer, which is a major achievement you're justifiably proud of. Um, yes, I, I'm, I think, because I always promised myself when I survived that, um, or I suddenly realised that my life before had not been everything I might have wanted. And I always had this picture of myself on my deathbed going, that was a waste of time. Or, in fact, the last thought that was going through my head as the train crash was happening was, it's not been worth it. And I meant my whole life before that. That was going to be my final thought. So I always promised myself when I had survived, the next time I'm on my deathbed, I'm going to be able to turn around and go, I made a difference and boy, was it fun. <laughs> and so that has great resonance to our time now, doesn't it? Where a number of people are saying, if you had to write your epitaph now, what would it say? And would you be comfortable with it? And if not, make a difference now. That's the kind of turn this situation into something that can bring positivity and uh, yeah improve yourself I suppose is, is that is that some of the things that resonated with you after after the train crash at Paddington? Not not improving myself no um, in as much as I think I've always been quite a driven person anyway so even beforehand I would study and I would learn new things and I would sit exams etc so that didn't really occur to me but what did was more about um, how short a time we have on this earth. I mean, it's a lesson I learned very quickly and how it can disappear like that overnight. Um, so ever since then, I just, I know it's an old saying that gets banded around a lot, but I truly know that life is too short. Um, so I've always lived ever since on the basis of, again, I want to get to the end of my life and then be able to look back. But more importantly for me, say I had fun along the way. Yeah, and so I, for those, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for a few years now, Pam, and we've worked together, and I challenged myself in advance of this boostcast to, can I summarise, uh, with no disrespect, can I summarise Pam Warren in four words? And these would be the four words I choose. I'd love to hear your reaction to them. Um, Generous rebel, reluctant hero. <laughs> oh gosh I like the generous rebel I like that bit um, I don't like conforming to it I don't like it if I'm one of these types of people that people can pick and hold and put in a box that to me is not good I'm not sure about reluctant here I, I mean I'm, I'm no different from anyone else um, it's just I went through a very unusual set of circumstances um, that then led me to take action um, that maybe other people might not have thought of, but I'm sure if people, if people were in the same situation, I'm sure there would have been someone that wasn't me doing exactly what I did. Yeah, that's really interesting. We're going to explore that, and I'll come back to some of the words. The reason I chose the word generous is because you are someone who is now a caregiver. You do a lot of things in supporting the community. With our business, you Spire, which is a, a business 
in a, in a similar way to your good self where we're looking to develop businesses and people we're people developers you generously hosted an event in london where you introduced you spire to your network so that's what i mean by generosity it's innate in you and then there's the rebel uh when you were 16 you decided after a few spats with your mum in particular you said right i'm off i'm just going to leave home yeah. and get on with my life so there's there's a lovely example of what i mean by rebel and then in terms of reluctant hero, this is an interesting one, because I think you allude to this in your book, Behind the Mask, where you talk about you were thrown into the spotlight because as one of the survivors of the Paddington train crash, you had to, because of the appalling uh, effect on, on your skin around your face and in your hands, you had to wear a mask for 18 months. And that be, you became known as the lady in the mask. And therefore the media grabbed onto that and said, we need to put Pam in the spotlight. So that's what I meant by reluctant hero, that you, you were kind of forced into the position of being the spokeswoman for the uh, PSG, the Paddington Survivors Group. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, well yes. Um, the Paddington Survivors Group actually came about because by the time I came out of hospital, it was three months after the train crash. So all the media attention had died down. Um, I honestly came out and came home and did not know who had survived, who had died, what had happened properly. Although the British Transport Police were still liaising with me, but that's a whole different story. I never really got on with them. Um, and yeah, when I set up Paddington Survivors Group, it was purely to get a few survivors together and we could then chat about things and once i started it it grew to be 81 members strong there was 81 survivors and really i thought to myself well okay we need to be a group we weren't going to campaign at all we were supposed to be a support group for each other because in a way we were an exclusive club we you know when we met one of us could say do you remember the smell and all 81 of us would know exactly what they meant. We wouldn't have to explain. So when we were going through harder times, mentally trying to cope, um, we found solace within each other. However, as we started heading in the year 2000 into the public inquiry into what had happened, it then began to be obvious that there had been failings in the infrastructure of the rail industry, which had led up to us happening. Um, it was completely avoidable. So that's when we all got together and I was around the group on a consensus. Um, so it wouldn't work in business all the time, but then it was more the majority carried whatever we decided to do. And that's when we became a campaign group. Our raison d'etre was always, we do not want this happening to anyone else. And we wanted to do our level best to ensure that it never did. Um, and it took five years, five years to actually make sure that everything that came out of the public inquiry, and we were happy with the results that came out, the recommendations that Lord Cullen made, we then kept up behind it. Because again, I don't know whether anyone's noticed, but the government, um, the media, industries themselves, they're very good at saying what the public want to hear at the beginning, and then as time goes on and more bad stories come out, etc., it all sort of fades into the background and nobody actually does anything. So we felt it was incumbent on us to keep going and just keep nagging them. So we became the little Jack Russells nipping at the heels all the time. So Pam, tell me more about resilience, this, this point about how, what are the main characteristics from your point of view about individual resilience and also this collective resilience that you had in the, in the PSG? Oh, well, as you well know, I mean, that is a whole sort of section of um, skills that you acquire. And I think some of those skills just come to the fore from your previous life. But some of it I had to do by trial and error. Particularly, I always talk about three layers. So you've got your base layer, which is fairly logical. It's working out what position am I in at this stage? And that is very much what I did um, once I was out of hospital on the road to recovery at home. 
The second stage, which is a bit I ignored for a long time, which is why I now have post-traumatic stress disorder so badly, even after 20 years, is the emotional, the more looking after your mental health and your mental well-being. I did not understand that for years, absolutely years. So I would say on the mental side, I didn't actually start recovering until a decade after the train crash. That's when I properly addressed. And building that into my resilience, I then learned two important things. One was to share the problem, not keep it bottled up inside, but also to let the emotion out. Even if you think you have no emotions about situations, you do deep down. And your subconscious is probably in turmoil. And it's so important. It's almost like um, letting a vent, you know, venting that emotional charge to make yourself, A, get rid of it because it's a negative emotion within your body, but also it then clears your mind to then become more proactive. And then the third layer to resilience is always how you plan how you're going to move forward, which is where we then start coming into the action section. Um, and that's a bit that I'll be expanding on a bit more with you. So, yeah, you, there's no point in trying to take action until you've addressed the where am I? And then I need to make sure that my mental, well, uh, mental health is looked after and I am addressing my, any problems that crop up. Then you can move into action. Then you are strong enough. Um, and to be honest, oh, sorry. Well, what strikes me, Pam, is this point you make about at first we're logical, then there should be an emotional realization and a letting out of that emotion before you then take action. And certainly on personal reflection, my logical brain says I must act. And therefore there's no space for the emotion and the, and the crying out or the expression of, of the emotional side. How did you do that? You said it took 10 years to get come to terms. What are some of the things you started to do to help relieve this emotional side? To be honest, I probably would never have discovered it if I had not had a psychologist. And I know having a psychiatrist and a psychologist people is not sexy or it's emitting weakness. Um, to me, it's actually emitting strength because you are saying out there, I need help. And to be honest, you're, those types of consultants, psychiatrists and psychologists, I actually went through three psychiatrists and five psychologists because your life does move on and you want different types of coping strategies or dealing strategies and not one person is always going to have the right answer. The way I can always explain that is a psychiatrist dishes out pills. That's really their main function. They medicate you. Um, and that, with my particular psychiatrist, that was fine up to a point, but there was a time when I wanted to come off all medication. I wasn't happy to stay on it. Um, as a psychologist, they, everyone has a different technique. So I've probably done every technique there is out there, but some of them I just found for me personally, just made me laugh. The rapid eye movement, I found absolutely not helpful whatsoever. <laughs> And um, I basically, I was turning up and telling the psychologist what I thought she wanted to hear, rather than actually bothering to connect. One of my psychologists, um, I got rid of after about, I did, I always give people a fair try, is what I say, I'll try things. And I kept up with him for six months, but he kept on saying, I need you to cry. You got to cry, you got to cry. And I know I advocate letting that emotion out, but to me, that's fairly personal. I don't want to break down in front of this person who is a relative stranger to me. Um, so I never did cry. And eventually I got recommended a psychologist. He's actually South African, works out of South Africa. Um, and the first words he said to me was, okay, this terrible thing has happened to you. However, you are the type of person I get a feeling that needs to find how she can move on. And that's what I'm here to help you with. And that's really when I started motoring forward. And to be honest, he's still with me. I still use him. Um, I haven't had to during this COVID crisis, but I have used him if I'm going through something fairly tricky myself. He's almost become my conscience or my sounding board. 
So I quite often Skype with him and then ask him his opinion. That's great. And tell me a bit more about some other people you reached out to. For example, Simon Weston, the Falklands war hero that was also badly burnt. And I know he made a difference to your understanding. Oh, huge. Tell me a bit more about Simon Weston. Oh, I love him to pieces. <laughs> we are very, very good friends now. But you know, if you think back to that time, he was already a national hero. And um, he happened to be part of a charity that I joined. He was their lead ambassador. And that charity had asked me to join them as an ambassador, which I did. So I didn't, I didn't ever get to meet him through the charity, but I knew he was involved. And I was going through a stage back then of, this was before I got psychological help, of self-medicating. And by that, I meant I was drinking and it was tipping into alcoholism. And although I wouldn't listen to my family or my friends back then, I think I knew deep down that there was something very wrong. And I had read Simon's book, one of his first books, Walking Tall. And um, in it, he described an alcoholic period. So I thought, well, if somebody's going to understand me, he will. Plus, he'd been burned as well. So I made contact via the charity, and he agreed for me to go to his home to meet him. And what was scheduled to be half an hour meeting turned into four hours. <laughs> And he was so kind, he was non-judgmental. And I think the thing that helped me particularly was, I couldn't go, oh, you don't understand, because he could perfectly understand. He'd been through it already. So I was more willing to listen to his advice. And I think the biggest piece of advice he gave me was, um, Pam, you have a choice here. You can either let the alcohol take you completely, in which case it will gradually and definitely destroy your life. Or you can walk away from it, you can turn your back to it. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I went home and I tipped all the alcohol in my house down the sink. And until many years later, about two or three years, I just refused to touch a drop of alcohol. I would not allow myself. And it was only when I felt men mentally stronger that I went back to drinking socially with friends. Um, but I still don't like to get to the stage where I'm getting drunk because that to me is again losing control. Thank you for talking about a national hero in Simon Weston. You are a national hero. In 2001, you were named Woman of the Year, which is an extraordinary achievement. It wasn't what your intention was, but because of the profound impact you had on our rail safety, a, a thoroughly legitimate award. And, and it was at a time when there were an amazing group of, of women in, in Britain at the time. So that's Marie Colvin, the incredible journalist. And um, it's also Dame Ellen MacArthur. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that time for you, because it was only a couple of years after the Paddington train crash. And I mean, I was, sorry, I was shocked. It came completely out of the blue. Um, so the Women of the Year Institute contacted me and told me that I'd been chosen as one of their Women of the Year and of course, yeah, you walk into this um, event and I was actually struck mute. <laughs> and I'm not often lost for words, but the women in that room, I mean, I had Valerie Singleton, because my hands were still quite burned, turning the pages of my acceptance <laughs> papers for me. I had Angela Rippon actually running around looking after me. I mean, it was just amazing. And the two women, um, Dame Ellen MacArthur, as you mentioned, she was quite a bit younger than me. So, yes, it was great to meet her. But um, Marie Colvin and I hit it off straight away. And I was so upset. It was her family that told me um, or contacted me after she got killed. And, um, yeah, I just remember she was such a... You know when I said mean by beautiful human being? She just... I don't know, there was something about her that attracted you towards her. And she never gave over this air of, oh, I'm bigger than you, or I'm an award-winning journalist, or anything like that. And it was her that I then, if you like, tried to model myself on. In so much, she was very down-to-earth and very, yeah, okay, so I've got this award, which is lovely. It's lovely to get the recognition. However, um, 
it doesn't make you any different from anyone else. And I think that's what the biggest thing I picked up from her. But yeah, no, it was quite interesting because for about, well, up until fairly recently, actually, um, my address book was quite full of dames and sirs <laughs> of the United Kingdom. I've been very lucky. I have met a lot of fascinating, interesting, some famous um, people. So, yes, I have been lucky. Well, both those ladies like you are heroes of mine. Marie Colvin, extraordinary journalist in Syria where tragically she was she was murdered. Um, Dame Ellen MacArthur, an extraordinary leader now in the world in terms of helping the world be a, a healthier place in, in terms of the work she does now. But at the time, I think in 2001, she wasn't yet the record holder. I think it came a little bit later. She, she, she held the record for the fastest single um, trip around the world in a yacht, which was extraordinary achievement and game breaking as well, because you know, it was, yachting was supposed to be about male preserves. And she just broke that down and said, no, you know, it's, it's about who you are and what you do, not, uh, not your sex. And I thought that was fantastic, fantastic in terms of changing old mindsets. Yes, and, and beginning that, that, that call for women to realise um, their own potential. You know, the, the potential is huge as has been proven in these um, ensuing years since then. So tell me, I'm going to change tack a little bit now because I also want to talk about people who have inspired you. And I want to talk about Nick Percival because he's the consultant that managed your recovery uh, clinically. Yeah. Uh, and based out of Charing Cross, extraordinary NHS uh, hospital and trust. Tell me a little bit about the role Nick played in your resilience. So after the train crash, uh, I ended up in Charing Cross Hospital. Most people were taken to St Mary's, but Charing Cross was a specialist burns unit. And I ended up there because I was, <laughs> to be honest, Mark, I was not supposed to live. They said I was supposed to be the 32nd victim, but I'm too obstinate to die, I've decided. And I was just lucky because there was a Harley Street consultant there called Nick Percival but he still did some days for the NHS and he just happened to be on duty when I came in. Bearing in mind, I was unconscious, I was in a coma already. So I only got to meet him when I came out of my coma, which was three weeks later. And um, as a surgeon, he was really A, kind, B, again, he spoke to me like an adult, and I think he had gleaned from my family that if you told it to me straight, I would cope. If you started fudging the issue or hinting things might be possible that aren't possible, I will lose it when I then discover that. So he was very good at explaining everything to me. And basically he held my hand. But the one thing I could not do, I could work on my hands. I could see the burns to my legs, etc. I could cope with all that. But the one thing I could not look at was my face. I had effectively lost all layers of skin from this lip upwards. And this is what he had grafted. This is, this is Nick Percival's face, this bit. <laughs> this bit is me. <laughs> um, but he had grafted me you look, one. You look absolutely extraordinary. You look fantastic. I said before the call, I said, you're looking very glam today. And it's a credit to you and a credit to Nick, isn't it, that that is true? Yes, although we've always laughed because where I'm grafted from the top lip up upwards, that won't wrinkle very much. So this bit will, this bit will, and I managed to save my eyesight. So these, round my eyes will go really wrinkly as I get older. So I'm going to end up looking like a tortoise. That's the only vision that I've got in my head. So I'm going to be all nice and smooth. And then it'll be wrinkle, 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 wrinkle. So, oh, time will tell. <laughs> um, tell me more about senses, because one of the things that struck me as a result of the, of the fireball that ripped through the carriage is that it affected your sight for a while. You, you loved music, but you couldn't really hear any loud sounds, and you struggled to use your vocal cords. So how did you stay resilient when all of the natural senses most of us have the privilege to, to be able to access. How did you cope with that? 
effectively you're trapped in your own body but you're conscious <laughs> i think um people can probably imagine what it might be like to be in a coma or um um you know, trapped in your body but you, you can't really express yourself because i was conscious i was still mute and as you say it had affected my hearing for a while but you have an awful lot of time to think and the only thing i could keep thinking was okay i can't change what has happened i can't suddenly miracle the train crash it never happened i can work out how i can survive the best way i possibly can and that was all going on internally and to be honest my voice did not come back um in any shape or form for almost two months so that's eight or okay i was unconscious for three of the weeks but that's five weeks of being unable to communicate much at all and also my hands were so burnt i wouldn't have been able to write anything down so yeah it was a very quiet time <laughs> the only time i really got bothered was by physiotherapists when they wanted to bend my hands to get them moving again um, or if I was being wheeled off for another operation. Otherwise, my whole time was spent with one member of my family with me because back then I was at high risk of infection. So, well, a bit like now. Um, but back then, it would have killed me. If, I'd, if I had got any type of infection, that would have been the end of me. So it was only one member of my family per time. And that just wanted to call out, I mentioned earlier that you fell out with your mum in early years, but your mum and your sister have been extraordinary in your, in your journey, haven't they? And I'd love you to just say a few words about what role they played. Yes, I think um, when I left home at 16, I think mothers and daughters quite often come to conflict. And uh, we both, both of us would agree that we didn't behave very well on both sides but i think it took the train crash to suddenly shock us back into what's important and afterwards um she was just there for me unfortunately she died two years ago herself from cancer and in a way i felt while she was going through the chemotherapy and, and trying to survive that i was able to give back a little of what she'd given me um during my recovery because she literally went back to bathing me and, um, do I want to share this with your people? Um, <laughs> basically wiping my bottom, because there was a long time when I couldn't. So she, she almost, I almost became a baby again. Um, and I will always love her for that. My sister, wow, she was like a tigress. <laughs> I hadn't realized, but she was, um, when I was unconscious, some of the nurses in ICU uh, wouldn't or would talk negatively across me um, or they would be rude as in not thinking I could hear. I can tell you now when you're unconscious you can hear but you build it in weird dreams. It, I was in the Moulin Rouge at one point for some reason um, and she fought for me like a tigress. She had nurses change because um, they had been so negative in front of me and even when I came out, although I was married, my marriage was never very strong. And she was worried about me returning home and then just my husband looking after me. So she gave up her university course at that time and she took a year out to come to my home and make sure that I was fed and watered and looked after. Pam, thank you very much for that. Because that for me is a brilliant setup for those watching to fully understand who you are, the experience you went through, but also how to cope, how to turn that trauma into something that could become positive.